welcome today. My name is Jessica Levy and I'm the young adult librarian from the Palisades branch of Los Angeles Public Library. Hi everyone, I'm Lynn Nguyen. I'm the young adult librarian from the Chinatown branch. We are here today to introduce the LMA program for Green Girl Leah. But first we wanna thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LMA programs to you virtually. LMA focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made program specifically, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. For instance, on Thursday, June 24th, at 4 p.m., we continue to celebrate LAGBTQIA Pride Month with Gation AF, <laughs> the hit sold out variety show that ran for a year at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in Hollywood before the collapse of the modern society. A branch of the renowned Asian AF show, Gation AF show, features the best of LGBTQ plus Asian Americans in entertainment. For this one time only event, a panel of comedians will host special guests for some frivolity at the virtual round table. Let's celebrate Pride Month and spill the green tea. Thank you, Lynn. Now for what we all have been waiting for today. I'm very excited to introduce today's LA Made program with Green Girl Leah. But first, I want to introduce the Palisades Library Teen Council members who will be interviewing her. We have Amara Vergara, a rising junior at New West Charter. Say hi. And Fiona Herzog, a rising junior at Palisades High. And rising sophomore Malia Mahalona Janelkarn. And now our special guest today. Leah Thomas is an intersectional environmental activist and eco-communicator based in Southern California. She's passionate about advocating for and exploring the relationship between social justice and environmentalism and identifying the ways in which injustices happening to marginalized communities and the earth are interconnected. You could say Leah is trying to make the world a little more equal for everyone and a little nicer to our home planet. Welcome, Leah. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over now to Amara, who I believe will get started with the interview. All right, um, so one of the first questions we have, um, let's talk a little bit more about the intersection of environmentalism and social justice. Why is it important to acknowledge the ways in which they overlap and advocate for both at the same time? That is such a lovely question and I think a great starting point. So sometimes when people talk about the environment and people, they kind of keep them as separate topics, but it's really important to remember that humans are a part of this great big ecosystem and this is our home planet. Um, and a lot of times when people think about climate science, they're talking about the what. So they understand that climate change is happening or they understand that there are environmental outcomes that are happening out in the environment, but it's also really important to consider the who. So who is being impacted by climate change? Who is being impacted by increased instances of pollution or toxic waste, et cetera? Because unfortunately, there are a lot of people all around the world that are being impacted by environmental injustices, whether it's unclean air, unclean water, or things that I consider to be basic human rights. So that's why it's really important to also examine the who and who's being affected um, in addition to the what, so the environmental problem, just to make sure that we're advocating for everyone and we're not missing anyone in this fight for the environment. Has the pandemic changed or elevated your views and perspectives of this in any way? Absolutely. So I always say that 2020 was the most intersectional year of my life. Um, and also, sorry, someone's coming in my house. But um, yeah, so there are a lot of things happening at once during 2020. There was a global pandemic. Um, so we're learning all about, you know, health outcomes in terms of like, 
um, how people's respiratory systems could be impacted. There was also a lot of climate injustice that was happening, so a lot of pollution in the air. Um, and then there was also, you know, systemic, there were a lot of social justice movements that were happening, whether it was the Stop Asian Hate movement or also the Black Lives Matter movement. So there was a lot of overlap in those three movements. And I feel like, you know, it might be intense. There's so much happening at once. But we saw how those things also interacted with each other. So, for example, um, the people who were being impacted by COVID-19 at higher rates um, are a lot of black and brown communities that were also being impacted by increased levels of air pollution. So that was kind of an overlapping thing where a lot of the same people were being impacted by climate injustice, um, injustice in the healthcare system, and also social injustice at the same time. So that really exacerbated the issue. Um, so yeah, this year I think really drove a lot of awareness to environmental justice and all the other things that were happening. That's very cool. Um, next, can you tell us a little bit about your background? When did you first develop an interest in environmentalism and how did you get your start in um, activism? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm from the Midwest. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I've always been really passionate about like plants and animals. And I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and then I went to Southern California, where I'm at now and where I think all of us are at right now. Um, and I started studying biology. However, I really was gravitating towards the classes that were talking about trees. So I was like, there's something not right here. So maybe I should look at another major. Um, and then I found the environmental science program within my university. Um, and I just really fell in love with it because I loved learning about how humans interact with the environment and, you know, our impact on the environment and things that we can do to be better for the environment. Um, so, yeah, and then there was also a lot of, you know, social injustice, unfortunately, that was happening. Um, the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement while I was studying environmentalism. So that's why I really started to narrow in on environmental injustice and the intersection between social justice and environmentalism. Um. And at what point did you realize you were going to make a career out of uh, these passions? Hmm. I wish I had an aha moment because that would be way cooler and would kind of be like, you know, in comic books when people have that like moment where they're like, I know what I'm going to be. Um, but with environmentalism, I feel like I just tried a bunch of things and I would recommend this to a lot of other people. Like, you know, I was writing a blog about um, eco-friendly beauty products. And I thought it was really cool learning about how even our skincare choices have impacts on our health and also the environment and the materials that we choose have impacts on the environment. And then I worked at an apparel company and I started learning a lot more about sustainable manufacturing and how it's really important to make materials um, that are using recycled materials or made in a way that's ethical and sustainable. Um, and then I started to join local protests in my area just to learn a little bit more about the climate movement. So I think a culmination of all of those things made me realize that, you know, I just really loved learning about so many different aspects of environmentalism, whether it's talking about fashion or food or the science behind it. I really just enjoyed all of it. So I wanted to find a way to communicate all of these topics to people in a way that was really accessible because studying environmental science, you know, there's some really, there's some big words. <laughs> um, so when I was studying environmental science and policy, I loved it, but what was the use if I couldn't talk about climate change or environmental justice with the everyday person? Everyone should be able to understand sustainability because it impacts, you know, our lives and everyone can be an environmentalist if everyone understands environmentalism. So that's why I use social media to try to find unique ways to communicate everything I learned in college to the everyday person because I don't think you need to have access to a higher degree to learn about all of these really interesting topics that are impacting the world around us. So it was a long journey, but I just love talking as you can see. And um, yeah, so I just, I really enjoyed it so far. What are some of the challenges and rewards of your job? 
Mm, that's a really good question. So I think social media, even though it's been around for quite some time, people are really hesitant to, I guess, uh, see the value for education with social media because a lot of people are used to it being kind of a platform where you're kind of like talking to your friends and stuff like that. Um, so I know a lot of people who are Gen Zers or younger millennials that are using like TikTok to talk about, you know, policy and environment. And there's sometimes some very jaded, not gonna lie, people who might be a little older who are like, why are you using social media? You should be reading a book. And the thing is, like, they are probably reading a book and doing something really similar to what I'm doing and finding a way to share that information with their peers that might be accessible. So I think that's been one of the biggest challenges, trying to show people the value of utilizing social media, because the truth is a lot of people are on social media, whether we like it or not. I would prefer that everyone read a 300 page like book about environmental science to understand all the nuances. But if I can capture someone using TikTok or Instagram or whatever it might be for 30 seconds and pique their interest in you know, being a better steward to our earth, then I'm gonna do it. So I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I come across, just not understanding how the younger generation is using what they have available to have conversations, have them quickly, and raise awareness about what they care about. So yeah, did that answer your question? I don't know if there's a part two. No, that did. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what does progress look like for you as an environmental activist? Um, hmm, what does progress look like to me? Um, really any step in the right direction because I have to find progress along the way. You know, that, I like that you asked like what's progress, not like what is the perfect ultimate solution? That was a great question that you asked because I think that progress is the solution because there's a lot of issues that are ingrained in our society and the way that we treat the earth and people that are going to take, it's gonna take progress and progression to get there. So some things that make me really, really excited is when you pull the younger generation, so Gen Zers and things like that, issues like climate change aren't as politicized as older generations. So whether or not you are right leaning or left leaning, more and more young people are becoming passionate about the environment. And I think that's how it should be. I don't think that science should be something that's politicized. And that gives me a lot of hope. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of, you know, conservative leaning towns that are really passionate about green jobs. I gave a talk at a church the other day for Christians who are really passionate about, you know, climate and things like that. So those things give me a lot of hope for the future because there's more people listening um, and really excited about, you know, protecting the earth. What would you say to convince youth into go, to go into activism? For example, if you're shy or introverted, how do you recommend getting involved? Ah, huh, if you're shy. So a lot of people see me talking, you know, on social media and beyond. So, but I'm actually like a relatively reserved person. Um, and, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm like actually a really reserved person and that's why I actually got involved with social media because um, it was my megaphone. So I'm a writer and sometimes things were really hard for me to say when I was in high school or in college. I would kind of stumble over my words. I really didn't like being in front of people. So I found what I was good at and that was writing and also maybe writing really lengthy captions on social media and that could be a piece of my activism journey. And I, I realized that um, your activism doesn't have to look like anyone else's because you might see people that are holding the megaphone at the front of the protest and those people, you know, more power to them. I wish that was me, I have social anxiety. Um, but realizing that any of our skills and talents can be applied to whatever movement that you're passionate about. The biggest piece of advice that I ever got that's really funny, one of my mentors told me, every revolution needs an accountant. 
So there needs to be someone who knows how to like balance some numbers. There needs to be someone that's really good at maybe like writing grant proposals. Mm -hmm. Maybe there needs to be someone who also is really good at giving public speeches and organizing, et cetera. But any of your skills can be applied to the things that you care about and never let someone tell you that your form of activism is invalid because there are a lot of people who can be really judgmental but every single piece of the puzzle matters. You matter, find whatever it is that you're good at, your skill, for me it was writing and social media and apply that to what you care about. And yeah, you matter. And yeah, that's my biggest piece of advice. It's very inspiring. Um, who have been the biggest role models in your life and how have they shaped you or your work? Hmm, my biggest role models. That's such a good question. Um, I wish I had some people off the top of my head. I mean, um, so I worked for someone named Rick Ridgway when I was working at Patagonia. Um, they're a sustainable clothing manufacturer and I worked at their headquarters and um, I was an executive assistant and he's like in his 70s, 80s and he was one of the first Americans to summit the world's highest mountain. So I was meeting him when he's like, a little bit older and just seeing the way that he did the coolest things in the world like climbing the world's largest mountain but also carried himself with so much like grace and humility i think that made me realize that no matter where you go in life to always carry yourself with humility and to always be kind to everyone um, and i think he's definitely one of my biggest role models in addition to that, Oprah, you know, I just, I love Oprah, she's great. I've never met her before, but her story is really inspirational. And I love the way that she has opened up the doors for other, you know, young black girls. Um, so when I was growing up, just seeing her on television, seeing the way that she was able to transform people's lives, um, that was really inspirational to me. Um, sorry. Um, you've made some powerful statements, such as the whitewash narrative of sustainability is not enough for a company to be considered a good company. So what would you want young people to know about the sustainability movement? Yeah, I would definitely encourage people. So something that I think was really missed from my education was not understanding that there are so many other cultures around the world who are practicing sustainability, even if they don't call it that. So for example, like my grandma, reuses her plastic bags over and over and over again. We were sustainable because we had to be, because that's what we could afford. So we had to go thrift shopping, we had to do those things. Um, even if you're looking at gardening practices or farming practices in other cultures or other cultures around the world who have been vegan or vegetarian for centuries, you know, and maybe they are being sustainable. So I think it's really important um, because for me, it was empowering to look at my African-American heritage and find all the ways that my family was sustainable without even recognizing it. And that made me feel included in the sustainability movement. So I think in environmental education, it's really important for people to find their personal story about their family, about what they care about, um, and how that too is sustainability, even if it's not mentioned in your textbooks. Because if you read the textbooks on sustainability that we have now, it's changing. You might think that you have to be a very wealthy person, it's probably not black. I'm so sad. You know, it's usually like a lot of representation of, you know, white folks or Western folks, et cetera. And I think there needs to be more representation of sometimes lower income people who are sustainable because they need to or places in the global south or cultures that have been practicing things sustainably for a very long time. So people can get the entire context of what sustainability is and not just think that you have to be very wealthy, driving a Tesla with a mason jar, and then you are like peak sustainability. I think it would be great to have more narratives in there. Um, so, um how do we dig deeper and uncover the truth behind company sustainability statements? 
That's a really good question, um, especially, yeah, with my background in sustainable apparel, I learned a lot about transparency. And there's a lot that companies don't tell people unless consumers demand wanting to know. Um, so there are a lot of companies recently where they have something that's like an impact report or sustainability report. So usually you can find those on their website and they'll tell you about, you know, some achievements, some areas of growth, but not every company does that. That's usually a red flag if a company doesn't tell you what they're doing or if they say, oh, we're sustainable, but they have no additional information there. So as a consumer, if you're interested in learning if a company you support is actually sustainable, go through their website, look at their practices. It should be abundantly clear um, that they are sustainable because that's something they'll feel proud of. And if they're not doing that, then they might not be really sustainable. But in terms of fashion in particular, I also know that a lot of sustainable fashion is very expensive. So if there's someone who needs to buy from, you know, a fast fashion place because it's the most affordable option to them, that doesn't mean that they're not an environmentalist because there can be so many other ways that they're practicing environmentalism. So this is kind of a segue, but just for people who are wanting to become more sustainable, I never want you to think that you have to buy your way into sustainability because that's, you know, capitalism. It might seem like that sometimes, but you have everything you need to be sustainable right now and to not shame yourself if you are participating in a system um, that's unjust, you know, like it's not the consumer's fault that there are mega corporations that are not doing things correctly. It's that corporation's fault and people are just existing in the systems that are available. So in your Vogue article, you say that every environmentalist needs to hold themselves accountable and do the inner anti-racism work to achieve both climate and social justice. What are a couple of actionable things that people could start doing today, right now, after this talk that could make that could begin to make a difference in the world? Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, and I say that because I participated in a lot of like climate strikes that were not intersectional. And there were a lot of instances where people would say, you know, social justice is over here, race stuff is over here, sustainability stuff is over here. So I think the first part is realizing that a lot of issues are intersectional and overlapping. And it's not just like race and environment. There's so many other things that are intertwined, whether we're talking about education, healthcare, environment, etc. Not siloing these issues and being open to exploring the intersections if they're there, I think is the first step, just being open to learning something new. Because the thing is, I know that I'm on a lifetime journey of learning. The knowledge that I have right now is probably teeny tiny in comparison to what I'll learn in the future. There's things that I'm passionate about now that might be wrong. So really just being open to shifting your narrative. Another thing is really listening to voices that haven't been represented in this space. Because the thing is, there are a lot of people out there. There are a lot of people of color. There are a lot of LGBTQ plus people who are very passionate about environmentalism, have started nonprofits, started safe spaces, et cetera. But they might just need amplification from you. They might just need support. They might need more members to come join them. So I would say to look up environmental justice efforts that are happening in your local community. Um, there's things like Patagonia Action Works that you can check out, Intersectional Environmentalists. We post a lot of things where we talk about um, intersectional environmentalism and find what's already happening and see how you can help, whether that's getting involved, um, donating to them, or just sharing what they're doing with your friends and family. So um, in terms of like sustainability, what are some first steps that you recommend to anyone who's interested, but especially for young people to follow a low waste lifestyle? Yeah, I think going back to that point that I keep saying is you don't have to buy your way into it. You probably have everything that you need now. So for example, when I really wanted to go low waste, I was like, okay, I need to go to the store. I need to get a bunch of mason jars. I need really expensive glass Tupperware. It's gonna take me years to build this collection to finally be low waste. Um, but the thing is like, I already have plastic Tupperware at my house. 
So is that the most eco-friendly option? No, but I've had it for two or three years. So I can live a low waste lifestyle by keeping what I already have for as long as humanly possible. Some other things, like if I have a shirt that I can no longer use, how can I keep that in existence for as long as possible? And that's how you can think about a low waste lifestyle. Like what can you do to repurpose what you already have and only buy new when you need to. So if you have a shirt, maybe you can cut it up and it's something that you can use for a rag. Or you can also use it, I use them for, um, I'll cut them in circles and then I'll just put it around like food, like a bowl or something like that. And you can put like a little scrunchy thing on the inside. So it'll just be like a food cover so you don't have to buy like aluminum foil. Um, but yeah, that's a really great way to start just evaluating what you already have and exploring new ways to like do cool things with it or challenging the status quo that you have to buy new. Like if you get a little rip in your jeans, maybe trying to learn how to sew or getting a patch and putting the patch over the top of it um, and just finding ways to get creative with what you already have. What organizations and resources do you recommend people check out and follow? You know, uh, I have to say it, Intersectional Environmentalist, the org that I started, you all should definitely check it out and support. Um, but other orgs that I also really enjoy are Slow Factory. They have something called um, Open Education, where they have free lectures where people can learn about sustainability and fashion and intersectionality. Um, I'm also, I really like Latino Outdoors, Hike Club, which is in LA. Um, there's so many, and you can find a lot of them on intersectionalenvironmentalist.com. I'm really excited about this next question. Um, what are some of your favorite books? Do you have any recommendations? And what are your overall um, favorite of all time books? Hmm. My favorite books, one of my favorite books is Their Eyes Were Watching God. Um, that's a really good book that I believe I read in high school. Um, I just love that book. It's so great. Um, but in terms of like climate and environment, All We Can Save is a really good book. It's a collection of essays um, from a lot of really cool, diverse women about sustainability and their culture, etc. cetera. Um, Braiding Sweetgrass is also a really amazing book by an indigenous scientist who, um, or biologist, scientist, I think, um, where she talks about, you know, learning science, but then also having indigenous wisdom at the same time and how both of those things can be valid when it comes to, you know, scientific topics. Um, and there's also a really great book. It's called Black Nature. It's a collection of poetry um, of over a hundred years of African Americans detailing their experiences in nature. And it's such a beautiful book and it's such a great reminder for me that even before the word sustainability, like my people were sustainable. And I think that's really important for people to do, especially if you're coming from a identity that isn't often represented, finding stories that are about sustainability and environmentalism. It's the most empowering thing in the world. So, and that's what really keeps me going. Can you recommend any podcasts that also would inspire you? Yeah, I would say so. All We Can Save is also the it's the podcast version of the book that I was talking about. Dismantled is a podcast that I do occasionally and also other members of the Intersectional Environmentalist team. Yikes is a really good podcast. I love that name. It's like yikes with an exclamation point. Um, it's by two UK climate activists where they talk about climate justice and intersectionality. So those are probably three of my favorite podcasts. Um, one more, just because we're here, would be Drilled. It's a really good podcast. Yeah, I'm going, I'd love to check those out, definitely. Um, uh, going back to your career, uh, where do you hope to go? And what, what would you like to achieve in the next few years or next 10 years? Well, something that I hope you all check out is my book that's coming out in March. 
Um, I'm really excited. This is the first time that I'm talking about it, but the cover reveal is going out in the next couple of weeks. So I'm just really excited that I got to work on like a longer form project. So I'm really stoked about that. Other than that, just finding ways to make impact in the real world. We have this large social media audience of a lot of people, but finding ways to bring that audience together in person. So having more events for people to get involved. We're doing a series of like hikes and events this weekend. And I wanna have even more spaces for activists to be able to connect with each other, find joy, brainstorm all their cool ideas. And other than that, maybe one day there's a farm in the future, that would be great. Yeah, that all sounds really awesome. Um, I think those are all the questions from us teens, but is there anything else you would like to share with us today? Hmm. Yeah, if anything, I really just wanna reiterate that sometimes people can be a bit judgmental all the time, you know, especially in the activism space. And I just really wanna drive the message home that like you have special skills and talents that only you have. No one can take that away from you and you can use that to change the world. I never would have thought that me posting a graphic on social media would lead to the term intersectional environmentalism being a legitimate framework that people are expanding on at universities from a social media post that I made. Um, so you have the power to create change in the world using your special skills and talents that only you possess. So no one can take that away from you. And if anyone tries to be judgmental, you can just do a little hair flip because they can't. Thank you so much, Leah, for answering so many great questions. Um, we have a few questions from our audience guests, so let's take a look and see. So oh, Bridget sorry. asked, do you have any specific organizations or activities that we can support or get involved in? I know you mentioned, you did talk about this a little bit already, but if you have anything, any other recommendations for us, please share. I would recommend, so if you're in the LA area, it's called Hike Club, so Club with the C. Um, they have a lot of like workshops and regular hikes that they're doing. Um, intersectional environmentalists, we have a couple of events this weekend, one tomorrow, um, a hike in Malibu, a beach event in Oxnard, and we'll have some more pretty regularly. Um, so I'd recommend checking that out. Um, some other orgs that I really like are Outdoor Afro, um, they go on hikes and have safe spaces for, you know, black women and allies that are trying to get out there. Latino Outdoors is a very similar organization where you can like find community and support. Um, so those are some of my favorite uh, orgs. I know there's probably a ton more that I'm missing out on, but yeah. That's awesome. I would love to join one of these hikes one day. Um, I have a question here from, uh, let's see. Oh, can you please, from Susan, can you please tell us more uh, about your circular economy, about circular economy? Yeah, so I love this because I made a video on Instagram about a circular economy and I'm trying to do like a backflip and I'm like flipping in circles trying to explain what it is. But the concept of circularity is so amazing and is something that I basically talked about a little bit earlier. So, for example, I don't know what I have in my house, but this is wasteful, but, you know, I'm not perfect. So this came with food that I got earlier, which is like a little plastic container. And with the circular economy, um, instead of just throwing this away, um, like recycling it into something new indefinitely, so as long as possible, there's so many possibilities for this plastic container um, with little onions in it. Um, it could become a fiber. It can be turned into polyester. It can be turned into another plastic container. It can be turned into a heavier plastic. So with a circular economy, the responsibility is more so on corporations to make sure that they have a plan to keep their items in existence for a long time. And there's really no reason to use, I guess, virgin plastic, so plastic that's made new, because there's already so much plastic out there. So a lot of corporations should be using recycled plastic or bio-based plastics, but keeping things in existence as long as possible. Um, and that's a circular economy. It goes over and over and over and over and over. Thank you. 
And let's see, our next question comes from an audience member. And again, I believe you did talk a little bit about this, but what changes have you made in your own life with respect to sustainability or what changes do you suggest to others, especially to those who are skeptical about sustainability? So maybe what to your, to the strongest skeptics, what, what's the easiest way to lure them in? Honestly, talking about finances is usually a really easy way because there's a lot of like economic benefits to this, even when you're talking about the concept of like um, green jobs, for example, in a green economy, like there are a lot of people who have lost jobs, whether they're in like the coal industry or other really extractive industries. And this is something like I have a lot of empathy for people who have worked, say, in one of those industries because they're just doing what they need to do to make a living. And a lot of people have lost jobs. And if you can provide them with jobs that are green jobs, um, whether that's like a wind farm or installing like a really cool like solar panel facility or something like that, I think that will incentivize a lot more people to not be so afraid of renewable energy because it's not something that's competing with what they were doing that can be a new opportunity. Um, but on a smaller scale for people in the everyday life, just talking about how you can decrease your electric bill or your gas bill or whatever it is, um, or how you can save this much on your water bill if you try that. That's usually a nice way to get people in. I mean, that happened with, you know, my family. You save a lot of money, really, you do, <laughs> um, when you're being more sustainable. And again, when I say saving money, that's when you realize that you can't buy your way into sustainability, because if you try to buy the most expensive sustainable fashion, the most expensive, you know, it's, it is kind of expensive, but yeah. Thank you. Did you have to convince your family then to, did they follow you? How did that work? <laughs> I guess it's like, it's, it's little bits along the way because I think I learned a lot from college when I was just preaching at people. No one wants to be preached to. I don't want to be preached to. And the thing is, like, if you lead by example, other people will just slowly start picking up on it. Like, my mom gets her own reusable straws and things like that. So I think usually, like, leading by example is how you can convince people. And with my family, they've just listened to me talk about it for so long that there are so many changes uh, they're making. And then I also just send them stuff. I'll be like, here's your new low-waste kit. So <laughs> it kind of, like, forces it a little bit. Thank you. Uh, we have another question coming in. Uh, how can we educate our friends and or family that those uh, members that those uh, who are wasteful ways that are harming the environment, for example, overuse of plastic or non recycling? I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but yeah. yeah. I mean, it can be a little difficult at times, but I would always say to not shame people because that's something else. Like, I know that I'm not perfect in anything that I do. Even as an environmentalist, I try to tell people, like, I'm not perfect. As you can see, I have plastic. Take a picture. It's fine. Just kidding. Um, but, like, I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. So I think when you're talking to other people, making sure that you're talking to them on the same level and not like you're all the way up here, they're all the way down there because there are things that their knowledge gap might be up here that they can teach you. So going into any conversation with understanding that this is like a mutual experience and never shaming people because again, people are existing in systems that are kind of messed up. It's not our fault necessarily that corporations decided to be really extractive and they could have had you know solar powered cars by now if they wanted to but they saw like the money and oil so people are existing in that system so i'm not going to shame someone because they don't have a tesla you know or because you know they might not be taking the bus every day or if they're shopping from fast fashion maybe that's all that's affordable to them so just being really compassionate with people and showing them other options that are available, I think that's a really great way to help people make those lifestyle changes. That's great advice. Uh, our next question, ah, Diana asks, how, what, what was it like to interview Al Gore? It was so cool. Um, I was so surprised that he, it was just really cool. Like when he said my name, I was like, you know me. Um, but it's funny to have like a social media platform and then to realize that like, oh, 
other people might know about this. Like, okay, there's hundreds of thousands of people who like know about these like infographics that I'm uh, pasting, uh, posting. But I think really having that conversation with him made me realize that even older generations see the value of using digital media and social media to be able to communicate to the masses. Intersectional Environmentalist was reached out to by the White House earlier in the year as well. And we hosted a conversation about climate justice on our platform and some of the plans that they're rolling out. Um, so I think that conversation and my conversation with Al Gore just made me realize the value because when they reached out, I was like, I guess we might be a valuable asset um, to them. And so many of these other digital publications are as well. And I think this is where the future is headed, you know, whether we like it or not. Um, but yeah, talking with Al Gore is really cool. Um, something that I appreciate from mentors, I don't know, just the way that they um, are open to intergenerational conversation because we both have things to learn from each other. So I think that really taught me like, whenever I'm having a conversation, whether it's, you know, the lovely high school students I was talking to earlier, I'm learning just as much from them as they might be learning from me. And it was really cool to have that conversation with Al Gore and know the value of intergenerational uh, dialogue. Thank you for that. Now we have another question here. What will the title of your new book B and when will that be coming out? I know you already said, um, was it gonna be March or? Yeah, so it's yeah. coming out March 8th, 22. Um, and the cover reveal is gonna be in a couple of weeks, but it's called The Intersectional Environmentalist, How to Dismantle Systems of Oppression to Protect People and Planet. I know that's a really long name, <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's coming out in March. We're so excited and hopefully we'll get to read it soon. Uh, is there um, is, is there going to be um, a Instagram for it, or do you already have a website for it where people can pre-order if they'd like? I will. That will be up hopefully in a couple of weeks, so you can be the first to know about the pre-order um, if you follow my Instagram, Green Girl Leah, or my other one, at Intersectional Environmentalist, because we'll be posting the pre-sale um, probably the first week of July. Okay, and you guys see it right there. There is her Instagram at the bottom of the screen. So be sure to follow her and stay updated with everything that's happening with Leah. Mm, this is a good question. How can we find out about any hikes? Um, I always post everything on Instagram. So Instagram is the perfect place. Um, or our website, Intersectional Environmentalist, will post things sometimes too. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I keep no, saying. no, it's fine. It's fine. No, can anyone join the hikes? <laughs> yeah, basically, anyone can join as long as you're bringing, you know, good vibes and a curious mind. Um, so, yeah, anyone can come on the hikes. Um, and we'll also be tabling at a Ventura Market tomorrow, I believe, or Saturday oh. for Juneteenth. So, yeah, anyone can stop on by. All right. You guys heard it there. Okay, well, I I feel like, are, are there any more questions from the audience out there? Please do feel free to type that in. Um, this is such a, a treat for us to be with Green Girl Leah, and we just want to make sure that we uh, get to all the questions that uh, you're curious of knowing or answering. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. I think that's it as far as, oh, you know what? I had a question as well. Um, are there any organizations that you recommend as far as donating to for those of us who want to contribute in some way to the cause overall and getting spreading the message across? I mean, of course we want to encourage people to get your book when it comes out, but um, any organizations for donating? Um, organizations that I'm really passionate about. Um, so Black Girl Environmentalist is a really cool org to donate to. Um, there's also a new org called um, Bad A Word Activist Collective. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I could curse. Um, they're really cool and I love it because their whole concept is like imperfect activism and I think that's just such a cool name. Um, also, Intersectional Environmentalist will be fundraising probably in the next month for some of our operational costs so we can keep doing the work that we're doing and create more events in real life. 
Um, also HBCUs, that's Historically Black Colleges and Universities Outside, is a new organization that's really great and is helping to empower people in the Black community to get outside and learn about, you know, some really cool things to do out in nature. Um, and also, yeah, Latino Outdoors and Outdoor Afro again are some of my favorites. Thank you. Um, uh, our audience member has another great question that just came in. It's discouraging to hear that the plastic we put in the recycling bins ends up in landfills. What are your thoughts about the future of recycling? Yeah, I mean, it is really sad. There are, I mean, that doesn't happen with all the recycling, but there are some people who unfortunately just like throw recycling into um, regular trash bins, which is really sad. Um, and again, I think that corporations have a really big responsibility because it shouldn't always be on the consumer to basically ensure that like a piece of plastic like gets back to some corporation to make it into something new. So I really feel like a lot of corporations should have recycling programs like they should be picking up. I don't know if this is radical or anything, but I think they should be picking up our trash. So for example, a lot of shoe companies like Teva, the sandal company, they have a new recycling program. Once you're done with your shoes, you can return it to a store or you can mail it back to them because they understand that it's their responsibility. So I think to combat some of that, um, companies should have you know recycling bins or target if you get excess packaging you should be able to drop off your packaging because that packaging came from target and they should figure out how to recycle it so i think other things like that will lessen the burden on consumers who are just trying to do the right thing and i think corporations should come up with solutions that are better for us absolutely yeah i think that's a great point that corporate responsibility is really critical to this uh, are there any other questions from our audience? Okay, Lynn. All right, well, thank you so much, Green Girl Leah. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you so much to all of you for joining today's LA Made program. Remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. Please join the summer reading uh, challenge, which started last week. Collect points for reading and completing fun learning-based activities. Go to lepl.org slash summer for more information and uh, you can register there and win some awesome prizes like this amazing bandana here. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to miss our LA Made program on Saturday, June 26th at 11 a.m. A conversation between Hanif Abdurraqib and Courtney Lilly. Abdurraqib is a New York Times bestselling author, and he will be in conversation with Courtney Lilly, head writer of the television show Blackish. We're letting you know early so you can put it in your calendar. We truly appreciate all your support. Thank you so much today to Leah Thomas, Green Girl L Leah, for her time, and to our wonderful teens from the Palisades Library Teen Council, Amara, Malia, and Fiona. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.